The theme of horror dates way back to folklore in the 18th century. Being the first novel to introduce something supernatural, The Castle of Otranto has spawned countless works in the same genre. As time went on, horror slowly evolved into a narrative that emphasized survival both in literature and film. Though of course we're not here to talk about books and movies. So let's fast forward to the 1970s in the era of... Atari. Popular at the time were mainly paddle games, space shooters, racing, and of course, Pac-Man. Though in 1982, on the Atari 2600, there was a title that decided to tread new grounds called Haunted House. So you see those pair of eyes oogling around? That's you. By collecting pieces of an urn, then escaping the house, all the while avoiding ghosts, spiders, and bats, you win. This marked the very first concept of survival horror in a video game. But as you can clearly see, the graphics at the time could only scare you so much. As technology improved over the next decade, so has the games, right up to Capcom's very own Sweet Home. Based on an actual movie, Sweet Home pushed survival horror to new levels. Not only pitting players against monsters, the game hosted a creepy atmosphere and narrative. With limited item supplies and a harsh difficulty, your characters were prone to die easily. And once they're gone, they're gone for good. For the first time ever, a video game made you truly feel scared and hopeless. Now let's skip ahead one year to 1990, where a young graduate from Doshisha University by the name of Shinji Mikami joined Capcom. Starting off with titles like Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Aladdin, and Goof Troop, he was soon recruited to start development on a game based on Sweet Home, called Biohazard. Initially, Mikami wasn't too enthusiastic about this project, since he had literally zero experience with horror. But at the same time, he saw enormous potential with the genre. So with that, he was on board. Even though he did acknowledge Sweet Home, Mikami did not want to copy it. Rather, he wanted to make a completely new game that went beyond the other horror games in the market. Sure, Sweet Home was creepy, but he wanted Biohazard to be terrifying. So what terrifies you? Tarantulas? Werewolves? Vampires maybe? But you see, all those things don't come back after you kill them. Mikami wanted something that will get back up and hunt you down. Looking for inspiration, he recalled a horror flick shown to him in junior high called Night of the Living Dead. Zombies in it were relentless and the kills were gruesome. He absolutely loved this. They were perfect for scaring the crap out of players, but at the same time, they moved slow enough for you to handle. Now, designing the zombies was only half the battle. To make it all work, Biohazard needed suitable gameplay, atmosphere, and visuals. The overhead in Sweet Home simply wasn't gonna cut it. Thankfully, hardware wasn't a huge problem at the time, thanks to the recent release of the PlayStation. So without hesitation, Mikami decided to put players in the character's shoes by making the game an FPS. He felt his view would evoke a deeper sense of fear. Though unfortunately, bad news hit. As development went on, the team realized the PS1 simply could not handle the environment they made. And there was a 90% chance the entire project was gonna belly up if they had continued. So Mikami was left with only one choice, a fixed camera view. Now, this was a tough transition to say the least, since the devs had to essentially start from scratch not knowing if this was gonna work either. I mean, there was a loan in the dark to take pointers from, but the question is, will this work for Biohazard? Well, against all odds, it turned out better than Mikami had ever imagined. The fixed camera allowed him to control exactly what players were able to see, thus controlling the suspense. Plus, backgrounds could now be pre-rendered, showcasing details never seen in any other game. What the hell is this? Though of course, we all know there's no free lunch in this world. So what was the cost of a fixed camera? The answer? 
Controls. With the angles changing at practically every turn you made and every room you entered, so did the controls. To put it simply, it felt like maneuvering a remote toy car. Mikami knew this as well, and he came up with two solutions. One, place the camera in the same position in every room. Two, make the game a point and click. And which did he choose in the end? Neither. The first option would be too boring, and the second would just make the game not terrifying at all. In the end, Mikami just crossed his fingers and hoped players will adapt. To add salt to the wound, his boss, Yoshiki Okamoto, literally said, Don't you dare put Capcom's name on shit like this. He hated the controls and the lack of save points. Hearing this pissed Mikami off, and he ended up losing hope right before his game went on sale. <sighs> Poor guy. Well, after all the struggles and drama, how did it turn out? Biohazard was released in March of 1996, but renamed in America as Resident Evil. The game sold over a whopping 2 million units on the PS1 alone, completely shattering what anyone at Capcom expected. So let's take a look at what made this game so dang good. Due to recent reports of cannibalistic murders happening around Raccoon City, Bravo Team was sent to investigate, only to go missing. As a response, Alpha Team was sent in. While searching, they were attacked by mutated dogs. The pilot chickened out and flew away, while the team were horrifically devastated. As Chris said, No! Don't go! Spotting a mansion up ahead, they charge for it. And this is where their nightmare begins. Myself. You'll follow the story of either Chris or Jill. There were two characters that never made it into the final game. Gelzer was the size of a gorilla and had night vision in one eye. He later became Barry. Dewey was based on Eddie Murphy, designed to be a comic relief, but he was dropped due to a lack of time. Shinji Mikami did it. All his fears and doubts were put to rest, cause this became the title that defined survival horror and quite literally gave it its name. Upon entering the mansion, you've got no idea what on earth is going on. Less than 10 minutes in, you're greeted with this. The glare, the chills. Of course, now in the year of 2014, finding zombies are as easy as finding squirrels. Heck, they're even in a game about cute plants. But in 1996, this was some next level stuff. And remember, everyone was just coming out of the Super Nintendo era, so these graphics were jaw-droppingly realistic at the time. Now couple this with creepy music. All I can say is, wow. In fact, according to Mikami, one of the most important aspects of Resident Evil was finding the perfect balance between music and silence. Some influences were taken from classical music, where the piece would soften or stop before the next melody. If you're the crowd that got into the Resident Evil series late, like RE4, then you're probably more familiar with shooting up like every zombie you saw. But in the original Resident Evil, no freaking way. You try doing that and I guarantee you'll be shooting blanks in no time. Here, let me give you a little comparison. Modern survival horrors such as Dead Space give you a buffed moveset, buffed weapons, buffed everything in order to handle the buffed enemies. RE1 was the complete opposite. Even though Chris and Jill are part of an elite special unit, all they can really do is stand and shoot. Or better yet, run. Which you'll be doing a lot of, thanks to limited ammo. So yes, the game's definitely no walk in the park. Though this isn't a bad thing, it was just Mikami's way of evoking fear. In fact, the USA version of Resident Evil was made extra hard on purpose to prevent players from simply renting the game, beat it, and return it. Capcom wanted us to buy their game, and I guess it worked. Though the lack of item slots and ambiguous clues can make some rage. Couple that with limited saves, you better figure out what to do and how to do it fast. Now, as good as Resident Evil was, there's one thing that it was infamous for. 
voice acting. Now, I don't really know who to blame here. It could be the script, it could be the actors, heck, probably both. One thing we can all agree on is that the delivery was just off. Life or death situations became laugh worthy, and the jokes, well. You were almost a Jill sandwich, to Jill sandwich, to Jill sandwich, to Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right! Despite the financial success of Resident Evil, Mikami claimed he only wanted to make one sequel, then take a five year break before working on another entry. The reason being? Staleness. He felt a horror game was the same as a horror movie. Here, just try to remember the first time you ever watched one. I'm guessing it might have won something like this. <gasps> but after watching a few more, the same scenarios play over and over. You know what to expect and it's not scary anymore. Put simply, it got stale. Because of this, Mikami felt horror movies slowly drifted from chills down your spine to senseless gore. Cringing at the thought of Resident Evil going down that same path, he wanted the series to go on for no longer than three. Unfortunately, none of this was up to Mikami, cause we all know what happens when a big company has a massive hit on their hands, right? <laughs> Mikami took the role of a producer while a planner from RE1 by the name of Hideki Kamiya was promoted to a director. Both had radically different preferences when it came to entertainment. As we already know, Mikami loves traditional horror. But Kamiya? He hates anything horror. Horror movies depress him. He likes action and happy endings. He hates spiders and he hates caterpillars. Which goes to question, why is he directing a Resident Evil game? Well, because of the differences, Mikami stepped back, which allowed Kamiya to handle the entire development process. And the result was Biohazard 1.5. A complete failure in Mikami's eyes. The scenery was dull, the script was bad, and the zombies didn't feel scary. If you're facing a deadline with a crappy game on your hands, what would you do? Scrap it and postpone. For compensation, the devs released Resident Evil Director's Cut, which featured a lot of minor changes such as new costumes, weapons, and modes. Even a Game Boy Color version was planned for release but was unfortunately cancelled last minute cause Capcom felt it sucked. Though, that's not what the leaked ROM shows. It's actually really good for Game Boy hardware. Then, it was back to the drawing board for RE2. First off, to fix the doll zombie issue. Kamiya included his worst fears, spiders, caterpillars, and even cockroaches. 10 to 20 textures were layered onto a single wall in the background, giving it much more detail and realism. Kamiya also decided to add brighter colors compared to RE1, such as Claire and Ada's red clothes, to match the heavier action and narrative. The game was released in January of 1998, called Resident Evil 2. The story carries off two months after the events of RE1, where Chris and Jill's trek through the mansion shed light on Umbrella and their biological experiments. Two months later, we find ourselves in Raccoon City, where Leon S. Kennedy, a rookie cop, has a pretty rough first day on the job. He soon bumps into Claire Redfield, who is searching for her brother, Chris. They eventually get split up and decide to rendezvous at a nearby police station, where the drama goes down. Two other key characters are introduced later in the game, Sherry Birkin and Ada Wong. Now when I said drama, I mean drama. Compared to RE1, RE2 is a full-blown soap opera. We got romance, we got betrayals, we got family issues, you name it. But the question is, why so dramatic? Well, this was Kamiya's taste. As we've mentioned before, he prefers action over horror. That's why events in RE2 are so much more extravagant than its predecessor. For example, Mikami wanted Tyrant to randomly surprise the player, rather than his glorified skydive from the helicopter. But was this such a bad thing? Definitely not. Resident Evil 2 still retained its survival horror roots, while having awesome additions like struggling, limping, and even this. But one of the most notable features in the game is what is known as zapping, 
According to Kamiya, this system was inspired by Back to the Future 2. The movie was more of a side story to its prequel, but it gave him a deeper understanding of the series overall. Thus, by including four unique scenarios in RE2, he felt players who had the wits to play through them all would be rewarded with a complete picture of the story. Either by putting a bullet through her brain, or by decapitating her completely. As we've mentioned, one of the only downfalls in RE1 was the voice acting. Thankfully, in RE2, the devs put in more effort to find the right actors. Ten Canadians were chosen for each character. Then the team narrowed it down to one. Unfortunately, the actors and actresses had to interpret their script raw with no visual aid, since Kamiya decided to do the recordings before any character designs was put on paper. Just picture a bunch of Japanese devs trying to explain the character emotions to a bunch of foreigners. And you can probably guess how that turned out. No. Resident Evil 2 is a brilliant sequel and regarded by many fans as the best game in the series. Eight months later, DualShock versions of Resident Evil 1 and 2 were released to accommodate Sony's new controller, which included vibration, dual analog controls, and other goodies. So with Capcom's massive hit on their hands, we'll take a look at what direction Resident Evil is headed for in Part 2. Also, before we go, congratulations to E. Lauder or L. Lauder SSS. I'm sorry, I do not know how to pronounce your name, but congrats for being the first person to guess the answer to the riddle, which is T virus, in turn, recovering Resident Evil. So, until then, see you guys next time.